questions and problems and anything that you have. Um, are there any questions about anything so far in the course? Things that you're struggling with? How your project's going? Uh, yeah. What about the exams? Are, are they going to be graded? Right, so he finished grading the exams late last night. <laughs> and he'll be sending you the grades uh, probably during class uh, while Aaron is lecturing when he gets here. <laughs> uh, yeah? For the assignment due Friday, there's a section on visualization design. design. And then we have the five sheet. What should we say about that since we're including the five sheet? It says, Sorry, it says like, what are you doing for your design? This is what right. goes on in the five sheet. Should we just say, this is what we did in five sheet, CR five sheet, PDF, or is there something? So, I mean, you should describe, like, your, um, so the five sheets are largely your sketches, right? And you should justify that with, like, words and say, like, this is why we made these decisions. Does that make sense? Yeah, so just right. yes. kind of backfill <laughs> what we've already done in the design with words. and Yeah, well, explain like why you made the decisions you made, not just the, so like the originals are just kind of the sketches of this is what it should look like, blah, 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 and then, but you really need to get into the, into the why, like why are you using a specific encoding, for example, like okay. are you using position over length, are you using a pie chart, why on earth are you using a pie chart if you're using one? If you have a really Stuff meaningful... Like yeah. So the justification for the yeah, exactly. for the edification. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, was Allison Aaron told me about that who's going to be here? So uh, we have a guest lecturer on Thursday, um, which is actually really exciting. I'm exciting. I'm kind of bummed that I can't be here. And then on Tuesday, you guys are going to be doing um, your group-to-group uh, -group feedback on your projects. And what? Like, I mean, like, what TAs are going to be here, too? Yeah. Oh. Answer our question oh, yeah. all the really hard work that we have coming. <laughs> Sorry, what? The one that's due next Friday. Oh, the volume rendering one? Yeah. Um, it shouldn't, so the volume rendering one should not be too hard, especially the, um, it, after Aaron lectures today, it should be pretty clear how to do at least the GL, GLSL part. It's like a couple lines of code. It's pretty simple. For the... Transfer function widget, that's all D3 and stuff you should know already, and TAs here can definitely help you with that. Um, and, and the TAs have been through the GLSL stuff too, they can help you with volume rendering. But, yeah. but, great question, thank you. Anything else? Problems people are having in class? Yeah. Can we make sure that we cover so this part two is where we're wiring up our widget to the transfer function. Can we kind of go through and make sure we know exactly what the expected output is? Because Right. So the tricky thing with the transfer function design is that it's very open-ended. We did this very much on purpose because we don't want to tell you, this is a transfer function widget, do this. No, no. But that, but the, the, that part is your own design. But at the end, your transfer function needs to produce this API value to, to plug in. Right, so, so a transfer function, all it does is given it, and I got Aaron will talk more about this today, but it's given an intensity value. So you have a cube of, you have a cube of numbers, right? Yeah. And for each of these little voxels inside this cube, you have just a value uh -huh. from like zero to 100, I think. Well, actually I think in the data we give you it's zero to one. I could, yeah. I could be wrong, something like that. But, so given a value, you just need to return a color with an opacity. Uh -huh. so, and right now it just returns that? a color only, so we just have right. to make a minor exactly. modification to it. Okay. So, yes. Well, you have to do a minor modification to actually be able to see a volume inside. Right. But then how you map to colors and opacities is, is tricky. And, that, and that's okay. up to you really to decide like how, you know, how do you pick the thresholds for like do you want right. to look at stuff that's right, okay. like low intensity or high intensity? And that could vary from volume to volume depending on what you're looking for. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, so kind of making sure you have a, a way to partition it depending on what the data shows you, basically. Excellent. Way to phrase it. Phrase that in your assignment. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's still looking for that one value for that delicate callback, that, that the colors and the alpha, and that could switch for any one of the calls depending on where you are in the volume itself. Right, yes. So 
think of it as the program, the volume renderer is calling your function repeatedly a to get times. that code. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, no problem. Any other questions with that? Okay. How's it going overall? I think we need to hear you talk about it. Oh, good. Okay. Everybody's intimidated by the, the idea of doing this, I think. Which, the, which is the tougher part, anecdotally? Is it the, uh, um, the transfer function design or the, the rendering? Probably the GLSL part, because, oh. well, because we don't have experience with it, at least in my... If it makes you feel better, the only thing you really need to change is... In fact, the only thing you should need to change at all is the GL cell shader, the fragment shader second pass. Uh -huh. And I'm providing explicit code in today's lecture. So <laughs> there should be very little room for error or interpretation after today. <laughs> that said, uh, this one's going to be a tricky lecture because I'm covering all of graphics, all of volume rendering, and transfer function design in uh, one class. And you lost seven minutes. And I lost seven <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Yeah, right. I don't know how to get this hooked up. This is the light. People kind of ask me questions. Just have a monitor at this point. So, what to do is I kind of have this window here. And then this is where you can just in case you know there is something. Because sometimes the screen might go down and people might say the screen is down or something. You can just check it. Do you just press the HDMI button? The power on. Here we go. Papers. Show of hands who's, who's done the reading. I'm halfway through it. Oh, good, good. Um, so one thing that we didn't explicitly assign, but um, Raya and uh, Josh were very wise to assign <coughs> last year, were explicit uh, chapters from the tutorial, the real-time volume graphics tutorial. And I ended up sharing that on the Piazza site when somebody had a question about the homework, especially, uh, I believe it's chapter six on, uh, on volume rate casting. That's exceptionally useful. <laughs> and today in class, I'm basically going to go over chapter one, which covers the volume rendering integral. All right, here we go. Okay, so volume rendering. So quick recap of last, last lecture, we talked about grids, unstructured and structured data, direct and indirect workflows, and interpolation. Um, for the SIBIS components of the exam, these are all things you should be sort of familiar with at a high level, um, especially unstructured and structured data. I think that's fun to ask questions about that. Um, today, I will give you two quick um, handy formula for interpolation. I'm not going to go over them in much detail. They're more just for information of the slides, if you need a reference. Then we will talk about computer graphics. We will talk about volume rate casting, which has immediate application to <laughs> homework six. Um, and I should uh, point out, I will actually be giving explicit code. So hopefully things will be a lot less fuzzy after today's lecture. And then I will uh, spend a while talking about transfer functions and especially transfer function design. Um, and actually Alex might want to help a little bit on that. He, he's given this lecture before. Um, so I, I've, uh, I actually tried to run this in image of 3D and I found that the, the, the slide examples were actually a lot more intuitive than anything I could recreate in image of 3D. I don't know if anyone else has had that, uh, that experience. But anyway, well, let's go for it. So quick interpolation recap. 
So th this is, I just want to make this easier than I made it in the uh, brushed over interpolation lecture last time. Uh, recall last time I had trilinear interpolation as a series of seven linear interpolations. And I want to point out that bilinear interpolation is really just three linear interpolations. You interpolate first along the y-axis, and you have two interpolations for that, and then once along the x-axis. Easy peasy. Trilinear interpolation, again, seven linear interpolations, four times along the z-axis, two, uh, two twice along the y-axis, and then once along the x-axis. Again, very, very easy. Um, so this is, the again, the formula we had last time for trilinear interpolation. And uh, the related formula, this is, it looks a little scary because it's a tensor product of three identical basis functions, but this is how you generalize it to any sort of basis function. That is just, that is not necessarily a temp filter. So if you wanted a B-spline filter, a sink filter, anything that you want to turn into a tensor product and turn into a reconstruction filter, this is how you do it. Um, this is just more for your edification. I don't think I would ask questions on this on the test. But you'll see these pop up over and over again in graphics and viz and signal processing, um, and also in 2D and uh, in uh, image processing. So I'm going to try to cover all of 3D computer graphics in about 20 to 25 minutes. Let's see how this goes. So what is graphics? Yeah, there's a lot of text on this slide. Graphics is um, 3D computer graphics is the process of, com of converting a 3D scene, so a model with triangles, spheres, volume, whatever else you have, into a 2D image, uh, which we call the frame buffer. And, that, and, and it uses a camera model to do that. So the, big, the three big pieces, if you have to remember anything from this, are camera, 3D scene, 2D frame buffer. And there are really two ways of doing this. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this, but this is the, the very high-level 38,000-foot uh, overview. The first is rasterization, and the approach here is basically to project the whole thing, sort and shade the texture, fra uh, sort the, uh, the texture fragments, and then shade everything in, at one go. Um, the idea here is that the camera itself transforms the primitives, and the tools it uses to do that are 4x4 matrix multiplication for the transform, the z-buffer algorithm for the sort, then scan conversion to actually figure out um, where primitives map, map to pixels. And then it'll do some kind of shading. Uh, cost of this is O of N. Uh, the APIs it used for this are, they tend to be GPU-centric, OpenGL, certainly what we're doing in WebGL, O3JS, but also uh, newer technologies like DirectX and Vulkan. On the other hand, there's ray tracing, which is a lot more vague, a lot more general, a lot more broad. The idea here is, in some ways, sort of the opposite of rasterization. The idea here is that instead of transforming all the objects, you do nothing to the objects. You keep them as they are, and you want to find out what pixels hit those objects in the form of rays. So for this, you generate rays, you search the scene for which primitive the ray hits, and then you shade, that's ray casting. And ray, ray tracing is really just a rinse and repeat process where you do this over and over again, integrating along the ray at places where you hit. And I'll talk more about integration in just a few slides. It's not as scary as it sounds. Um, the, in ray tracing, the camera finds the ray, primitives stay where they are in 3D coordinates. So really, this computationally consists of many, many parallel tasks, mostly e executing very heavy 3D vector arithmetic, sometimes four-tuple uh, you know, four, four vector arithmetic, mostly three-tuple. And this is tricky to do. Uh, the APIs for doing this are mostly proprietary right now. They're things like NVIDIA Optics and Index, Intel Ivory and Osprey, and I'd say more common than either any of those are write your own solutions, uh, which both industry and uh, well, students such as yourselves will eventually do if you uh, take a uh, uh, ray tracing or real stick image synthesis class here at Utah. And what we're going to do in our assignment, and basically what's mostly done for you in homework six, is we're hacking the GPU fragment shader to do volume ray casting. So we're generating rays in a sort of uh, a weird way by uh, rasterizing back and front faces. And I'll show one picture that will make, make this immediately obvious. And we're using that to create rays, and then we're basically ray casting. Uh, a little counterintuitive, but that's what's going on. Uh, and as you can see later on, volume rendering can be implemented either way. There are 
uh, any number of ways of doing volume rendering. So uh, speaking of that, the, uh, the conventional ways people would do volume rendering or large data direct visualization in the past uh, were using proxy geometry. They'd use 3D texture slicing um, uh, to, uh, instead of having to cast a lot of rays, generate for some sort of proxy geometry, uh, put textures um, onto it, and then use that to sample the volume uh, at regular intervals. Um, but there are also splatting based techniques, not just for volume rendering itself, but for massive ISO surface rendering, massive implicit surface rendering. So one of the papers I remember from when I was a, a beginning grad student was uh, the Rusin Kibitz and Leboy Q splat paper. And you know, this is really, I'd say, this and slicing are really the canonical examples of using proxy geometry for <coughs> massive direct vis problems, but in a very indirect way. Um, but I still contrast this to sort of the indirect viz approach where you really are taking something that's volumetric, you're turning it into triangles, and you're just using the fixed function OpenGL pipeline in a pretty unclever way. And that's the way 90% of viz and BTK is still effectively done, although that's changing. And again, in homework six, um, we are still using the rasterization pipeline. Um, but that, that said, I will say that ray tracing and ray casting are increasingly common. They're increasingly easy to use. And I wouldn't be surprised if a few years from now, you end up using th something that's a lot more direct, a lot more obvious, and a lot less of a headache. <laughs> so just a quick visual depiction of rasterization versus ray tracing. This is some work that I did back at TAC. Uh, this is a standard OpenGL lit image uh, from a roughly 12 gigabyte data set. Uh, this is with standard OpenGL rasterization and VTK. And this is uh, feeding it through the Embry ray tracer. Still polygonal data, but um, we're using a ray tracer instead of a rasterizer. And voila, it looks a lot better. Now, I should say that this renders about maybe 20 frames per second. There are a lot of triangles. Uh, and this, uh, if I did primary rays only, would be actually about 60 or 70 frames per second. But uh, with, uh, with all of this, it's. Uh, uh, we're down to maybe um, a frame every 10 to 15 seconds, so it can get quite expensive once you do super sampling and all the effects you want. Um, so graphics, um, graphics primitives. This is different from viz primitives, uh, not that different, but really anything that we did in 3D for volume data and what we in, uh, I guess, a more topologically correct parlance uh, refer to as three manifolds, we're really doing for two manifolds in the graphics world. So in graphics, we're talking about points, we're talking about lines, and we're trying to figure out how we cobble those together into surfaces and then render those surfaces. So the primitives that you would see in a fixed function pipeline, a, a graphics API like OpenGL DirectX, would be a triangle fan, a triangle strip, quads, um, and there are several others, but, but those are most of the time we, people use triangle strips in practice, uh, at least that's, that's what I've seen. Um, Increasingly, they use a big buffer, of, uh, a, a big uh, vertex buffer, and just feed everything into there. And uh, you say, I want to use triangle strips, and you're all done. And that's how most of fixed function graphics is done currently. Um, the, most, most of graphics is still, especially if you look at VTK and how that's used, it's still basically uh, colored vertices. Um, if you look at a texture map of a hex mesh in VTK or isosurfaces of the hex mesh, very often you'll be looking at color mapped per vertex, um, either on the isosurface of the TET mesh or the you know, TET or hex mesh itself. And then these will then turn into faces, which will be uh, shaded use it usually um, at per face normals instead of per vertex. This is sort of the default way of doing it in OpenGL. Um, and then you have, um, uh, you can certainly control opacity. That's maybe not the most intuitive way of describing it. Well, I'll explain alpha blending and opacity in just a slide. And then lastly, you can apply any sort of 2D texture you want um, with texture coordinates and very centric coordinate interpolation. Um, that's not something we're going to really do for the assignment, so I'm just going to gloss over that. Take Chuck's class, but graphics class, if you want to, uh, to exhaust, exhaustively explore that. Um, we're trying to do less of this and it's not more. <laughs> so the rasterization pipeline. So when I talked about the, uh, talk about the fixed function pipeline, this is what I'm alluding to. 
You start with uh, both your data, so your, your triangle data or other data, so these are the primitives, and also a camera model. And then you apply the transformation matrix, that's the 4x4 matrix I alluded to before. Then you do the lighting and projection step, and then um, you have the actual rasterization algorithm. Then you um, apply texturing, and then you have an image that comes out of it. And that's really the whole top layer of the pipeline is the fixed function, nothing clever pipeline. Below it, you have sort of the optional pipeline, which uh, is increasingly important in the graphics and used for pretty much every game that you would ever want to run. Every game engine has some component of the programmable pipeline. Um, and relatively new are the compute shaders, which really let you do anything to your primitives and uh, really any data that you have, even before it makes its way into the pipeline. But it's, it's just kind of on the GPU already. You've created a buffer for it uh, for you. Use compute shaders on it. Um, and then for the pipeline itself, you have the vertex shader first. This is sort of the simplest, dumbest, easiest shader that you would apply. It really just is, they're, they're simple one-to-one -one transformations on individual vertices most of the time. The geometry shader came along later. It's a little more complicated. It actually lets you create more than one ver um, output vertex from one input vertex, and you can do some fancy things with that, mostly in tessellation. Uh, so if you have NURBS data or spline data, um, I'm not sure if you could use this in visualization for higher, higher order elements, but that might be an example of something you do with the geometry shader. The fragment shader, that's really what we're going to use in homework six, and that's what uh, I'd say I've used but, you know, by far the most out of the whole graphics pipeline. In fact, my whole goal is to do the least <laughs> in, uh, in the conventional graphics pipeline and basically stick to these three boxes right here. Uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe that first box too, where you have the camera and the primitives, but really just these three boxes where you, know, you, you have the fragment shader and then you create an image. Um, and ideally, if we don't want to have to do that at all, ideally we just have compute shaders and camera primitives. And, I'd say this model is probably more akin to what you do with something like NVIDIA CUDA or OpenCL or uh, Intel ISPC, but, um, uh, but it's, it's probably a little bit tougher to do with 3JS and WebGL right now. Um, so, camera. Um, how many of you, just quick show of hands, how many have had a computer graphics class before? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm actually kind of glad I'm covering this. Okay, um, so the, the camera model is actually pretty, pretty intuitive. Um, the idea here is that you really, you just have an eye, you have a focal point, the, uh, what we very often call the look at, and then you have an up direction. And um, it, it depends on how you specify this, but the way I usually think of this is in OpenGL API uh, parlance, you're talking about creating a viewport then it's your frame buffer, which is um, uh, pic uh, n pixels wide and n pixels high. Um, and then you have a perspective transformation that's going to be, uh, it depends on this width and the height, also the field of view angle, which is sort of the solid angle of the, uh, well, really not even solid angle, just 1D angle of the width um, of the camera. Uh, so actually notice the height because it's field of view wide. Um, and then you have the near and far planes. So this would be the near plane, and this would be the far plane. Actually, the width and the height should be right here. I apologize for that. Um, it, it, it's all the near plane. And all of the objects that you're looking at are somewhere in between the near and far planes. Um, and this is done for you in 3JS pretty easily with this glviewport uh, call, which pretty much maps one-to-one -to, -one to the GL call. Uh, and then similarly, you have a, a perspective camera call um, uh, that uh, it looks a lot like blue perspective, um, and it's, it's going to uh, set up that transformation mode for you. Um, and the whole point of perspective transformation, I contrast this to orthographic projection, which I do not have a slide on. The whole point of perspective projection is that you want things closer to you to really appear closer to the point where they really spread out when they get close to you. So look at this, this window, uh, really spreading out towards the viewer as it gets close to the origin. That's the canonical example. And this looks fairly realistic. Um, orthographic projection, where you don't have that, where you really have a bunch of purely parallel lines um, de defining pixels in the scene and how they interact with objects, uh, that's, um, it's probably a little bit better for CAD and modeling applications, 
but in terms of fly-through realism or perspective projection with a nice wide field of view is, is what you want. And the way this is implemented in a 4x4 matrix is really this last coordinate. We call this the homogeneous coordinate, and it's this C over N. Uh, very often when you hear people talking about the perspective divide, that's what they're really talking about. This won't be on the test. This is really just for your own edification. It will be on a test in the graphics class. Uh, but, uh, but in the Viz class, I'm really just putting this up uh, to give you a sense of um, you know, what you would do in, in raster graphics, in rasterization. Now, ray tracing, I think, is a lot more simple than any of that. Uh, there, you have a pipeline that isn't, I, I call it a pipeline because it's sort of the, the order that you have to go through, but none of this tends to be implemented in hardware. Uh, I guess in some cases, the, um, for example, uh, Eric Rimbaud's hardware ray tracing, they would maybe have specialized hardware for some of these. Uh, but um, for the most part, this is all stuff that you would do in software. You would, again, start out with your camera and primitives. Uh, and from this, you would build a spatial search structure. So this could be a grid, KD tree, BVH, etc. And then you will have an algorithm, a traversal algorithm, that searches through that structure. Um, and finds which object or objects you hit. And for each object, you're looking at the closest one that, that you hit. You're going to roughly do this in order. If you miss it, you, you know, pass through the objects and keep on going. And, um, and then, uh, and this is the intersection process. You, you basically find the intersection point where you hit the surface. Then you shade and texture pretty much as you would in, in rasterization. Um, and the big difference is that it, you can actually keep on integrating along the ray and keeping on going, and there are various optical models for how you would do that, uh, starting with wood tra ray tracing, going all the way through Kijia and uh, more crazy uh, ways of integrating along the ray. But at the end of the day, uh, this process keeps on re repeating over and over again, hence the rinse and repeat from the first slide, and you end up with a very nice image like the one I showed you a few slides ago. So, how would you create a pinhole camera? So this is equivalent to the perspective camera that I had in the previous rasterization slide, uh, with just a few differences. There's no matrix at all. There's no 4x4 four four matrix multiplication, no homogeneous coordinates. Uh, what you're doing here is you, you still have um, the origin, look at, and up vectors that define your pinhole camera, but the process of generating rays from that camera is a lot simpler. It's really just two cross products, um, three normalizations. But then you have a little bit of math to essentially create the offsets along each ray for how big each pixel is. And then each pixel, you can sort of see this equation down here where we create the ray direction. It's really just a linear combination of the vectors that define that pinhole camera transformation. Well, not transformation, just the, the pinhole camera itself. So this is all three vector arithmetic that defines your rays. And I wish it were this easy in the 3.js example. Most, in theory, it should be this easy. In the 3.js example, this is what's going on underneath the hood. We're actually rasterizing a bounding box. And this is a very clever technique that Jens Kruger came up with in 2003 back when programmable shaders were first available to people, and everyone was looking for a way to actually start to ray cast and ray trace on a GPU. And in practice, it was slow and hard and, and not as good as everyone hoped, but it's gotten much, much better over the years. And the idea that we're using today in 2015, almost 2016, is actually the same as the one that Jens Kruger came up with in 2003. The idea here is to first, in, in one pass, uh, rasterize the front faces with the texture coordinates uh, uh, on a 0, 1 cubed box. And then in the second pass, rasterize the back faces of that same box. And the idea is that in the first step, you capture the front position. And then in the second pass, you're going to capture the back position. And then you're able to generate a ray between front and back positions. And this code, if you look at fragment shader second, pra second pass dot frag, this should be almost immediately obvious. This box, in fact, is exactly what you're looking at when um, in the, the default behavior of fragment shader second pass. Um, it seems scary if you don't have this image, but this is really all it's doing. And in fact, I'm going to uh, take questions from the floor if, if anyone has them. Any questions on this? Is it, does that kind of make sense? <laughs>
Okay, good, good. I'll keep on going. Shading. Um, this is probably the most useless part of today's class because the, <laughs> the shading assignment is completely optional. Um, it would be great if you did it, and I'm actually giving you explicit code, so in theory you can just cut and paste it into your, your volume rendering assignment. And if you want to do something more clever, uh, then talk to us about final projects built around lighting and shading. Uh, there might be some good ideas. But this is really to give you an idea of how you do graphics, not just with fixed colors, but actually with some sort of lighting model. Uh, and I'm borrowing heavily from the um, IU Purdue slides um, that Mariah and Josh also borrowed heavily from in this lecture. So the idea here is that if you just look at fixed color, you don't have lighting and shading, it doesn't really look like a 3D object. You need lighting and shading to make it look vaguely realistic. It doesn't need to look photorealistic, but it needs to look good enough that you sort of get a sense of the shape um, based on where a light is and where you see the object. And the tools that we use for this are the surface properties, so the material of the surface itself, the normals, um, so basically the, these little vectors that point out of the surface, those are the normals, and the lights, the position of the lights, or sometimes you'd have a uniform directional light in the scene. Um, either way, those are, those are what we tend to use in the simplest uh, lighting and shading models. And we're only going to cover this in a very, very superficial way. Um, although less superficial than previous classes because I have a whole slide on the rendering equation. Um, so Fong, the, the Fong shading model, and this came from Guichong Fong, who did his PhD here at the University of Utah under um, Don Evans, I believe, in 1975. He created this, uh, this uh, shading model, and it was actually fairly intuitive. And, and it's also important to note that the Fong lighting model, this, is actually very different from what we call Fong shading in computer graphics. Fong shading is really a, um, it's in a sense when we do Fong shading, it is uh, very often really grout shading, uh, where you're doing it per vertex and smoothing it together. And real Fong shading is done per pixel using this lighting model. So that can be confusing to people sometimes. We don't need to worry about it. Anytime we talk about Fong shading, basically think of a nice smooth surface with a pretty specular highlight. Um, and it's actually very intuitive. This I, you're going to see this a lot in the next several slides, this I stands for radiance. And what you're looking at here are the specular components, the diffuse components, and the ambient components. The ambient components are more or less fixed. They're sort of, if you had no light at all, that's what you'd see. That's kind of a hack. Um, the diffuse component is based on the cosine term, roughly, when we use a dot product to approximate that. And that sort of makes things look more or less dark or light depending on this, uh, this angle that you're hitting it. And the specular term is a cosine term times, uh, based on the half angle vector taken to a power. And that basically gives us that sort of shininess look. And this is sort of an illustration of what it looks like. Here we, we can see we have the light source here, we have the eye here, these are, this is the, um, the angle, this is the normal of the surface, and this is the uh, reflectance angle that we're going to get from the light. And this is really what the cosine term and that dot product, really those, those two dot products are doing. And not shown in this picture is, let's see, is that the half angle? Or it, the half angle should be, should be this, but it's, yeah, that's, that's actually, that's right. yeah, that's right. Okay, that's good. Um, I expect it to be there, but oh well, that, that, that'll actually work. Um, it's probably because of, of the, uh, the weird perspective. <clears throat> and, it, uh, it, yeah, and that's the model for perspective reflection. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is indeed the, uh, the half angle. Uh, and again, it's cosine n to a power. Uh, oh, okay, the diffuse reflection component, this is, there's no half angle here, this is just n dot uh, l, so the normal uh, dot, uh, dot product with the light direction. And that's going to give you this sort of uh, really fake, but you know, good enough approximation of what diffuse surfaces look like. Uh, diffuse surfaces are actually fairly computationally costly to uh, to render um, in the right way. Uh, you need minimum ambient occlusion, which is sort of a, uh, a two-bounce approach to 
to computing diffuse, reflect, diffuse interreflection off of surfaces. And ideally, you'd like something a little bit more accurate than this to really capture material properties. Um, but diffuse is, a, it seems easy, but it's actually, in, in a sense, the most computationally costly part of ray tracing or path tracing. Uh, and again, that's just uh, n dot l is diffuse. Um, and the, the, these, I guess, line by line will look a little bit confusing, but I have one single piece of code that will give you all font shading, and you can just drop it in. Um, so to, uh, when you combine this together, what you would do is you would take the diffuse term here, and then the specular term here, and you would sum these up for all different light sources that you have in the scene, and then you would have the ambient term over, uh, just once. And uh, this is what it looks like with ambient only, diffuse only, specular only, you almost never see that, and uh, phone reflection. And this is, <coughs> this is the full phone model right here. And here's some code, um, both for how to compute the normal uh, given a point of space and a value in your 3D volume in homework 6, and how to do the full per pixel uh, it, using an interpolated uh, point in arbitrary space um, uh, uh, value in the volume, uh, essentially doing both diffuse right here and bong so specular uh, highlights right here. And uh, this is just for one light source. Uh, it gets expensive when you do it for many, many light sources. Uh, but I think this should be fairly, fairly intuitive. Um, it will actually be more intuitive when you see the volume raycasting code, which is what we're going to cover in just a minute. Now this is going to be the most math we'll have really in, in any slide on, um, on today's lecture. Um, but I thought it's really, it's really worth mentioning this because the whole point of this paper, and this is uh, Jim Kajia's seminal SIGGRAPH 1986 paper, The Rendering Equation. The whole point of this paper is to tie together all of graphics into one equation. And if you go through this paper, you'll see the simplest form of computer graphics, which he derisively calls the Utah approximation, referring to the work that, that Blin and Fong did. Um, and then he uh, says that you can actually refactor this equation to implement widded ray tracing, which is just sort of single ray, non-distributed, bounce-to-bounce ray tracing. And that's really just a sum where you end up multiplying these terms together uh, uh, one by one after the other, integrating that way. And then you have another equation that is refactoring this big equation on the top into radiosity, which is sort of the way I describe it is sort of a, almost like a finite element simulation for how you would compute light transport in a general scene. So it's a, I think of it as more complicated than ray tracing, but that it was really used for baked textures for a long time in, in a lot of games. Less so now, everyone just uses photon mapping for that now. Um, and most importantly today, um, I won't, certainly won't make you remember this equation for the test, but you, if you ever write your own volume rendering papers or get involved in the volume rendering literature and you need to refer to an analytical integral that describes what's going on in volume rendering with a 1D transfer function, this, um, this equation for irradiance <coughs> over a ray segment, so A and B are just uh, scalar values along the ray, uh, this is attributed to Sabella, but if you read the Sabella paper, you don't see it anywhere. Everyone seems to attribute this to, uh, to the Sabella paper for some very odd reason. But it is in Jonas's 2003 paper on, multi on Gaussian transfer functions for multi-field viz. Um, so if nothing else, refer to that paper, and you know, of course you can refer, refer to these slides. Um, this, I'd say, is the shortest way I can mathematically describe what we're doing in volume rendering. If you had an infinite number of samples and in, in a way of analytically integrating over the transfer function space, which of course we don't. Uh, so yes, this is the only one you need to remember for this class is this equation right here. But I probably will not require everyone to spell it out on the test. But that, that would be cruel. So uh, onto something much more simple that I might ask a question on, <laughs> on, the, on the exam. This is alpha blending. Um, and alpha blending is sort of the, the operator for doing what we're trying to do in this equation right here, in the Sabella 
uh, rendering equation for volume rendering. Um, the idea in alpha blending is it's actually very simple. You have two semi-transparent objects and you want to see how they look when you plot one on top of the other. How do you do that? And um, in graphics we refer to alpha blending or compositing or the over operator for doing this. Um, it's actually a very, very simple operator. You see this in the graphics literature all the time. Um, and you can actually specify it in, in OpenGL, the blend function, uh, which I think defaults to alpha one minus source alpha. Uh, and that's really what it's doing by default. And that's exactly what you're seeing in this example, is you have a front surface and a back surface. And depending on whether you're blending back to front or front to back, so in rasterization, it's usually back to front. In the ray tracing that we're doing, or the ray casting that we're doing, it tends to be front to back. Uh, depending on these, you're going to blend one of two ways. And we will actually go over that in, in great detail later on. But generally speaking, what you do is you have an operation for the color, uh, where you're compositing the color. And then you have another operation to update the alpha. And uh, this is what we refer to as the over operator. Um, the code for this, I think, is a lot more simple than that, that example over there. And the reason I like this code is that you can actually just copy and paste this more or less directly into homework six, and this will give you correct front to back um, alpha blending. Uh, the idea here is that somewhere as a global variable or in your fragment uh, shader main, you'll have this accumulated alpha, which starts off, off at zero, and you'll have accumulated color, which also, also starts off at zero. And then you're going to find a, a new color, which you'll get as a color sample, an alpha sample, and you're going to blend this new color into your accumulated color and alpha over and over and over and over again. Um, now this is maybe simplifying it a little bit. There's one tiny detail that I'm leaving out that you'll probably figure out the hard way when you start to implement this in the homework, and that is an alpha correction term. Um, where you're basically uh, factoring in the spacing along the ray, so the number of samples you're taking into how, how um, high the alpha term for, for any one of the samples is. Um, and that's something that, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but um, in the worst case you can sort of wing it. And in, in practice, the right way to do it is using an exponential term, which I'll show you the math for in just a slide. Um, and yes, in short, volume rendering is really just doing this over and over and over again for each sample in a tight loop. This is one reason why it gets expensive. So, volume ray casting. Um, how many of you have started looking at homework six? How many of you basically understand that it's this? Okay, we're good. That, that's, that's really good. Um, yes, so as I said before, volume rendering, we'd like to say it's this, um, but it's really this. Uh, and that's because we have discrete data, we have a fixed number of samples that we're going to numerically integrate over, and this is the real world. We, we don't have continuous logic to work with. It would be very nice, but we don't. Um, and um, that's just for, for one pixel, one ray. And if you apply either the pinhole camera in a real ray tracer um, or the uh, back and front um, uh, uh, rasterization method that we're in practice using in Homework 6, this is what you're going to get. So this is back, this is front, and we want to do this. So we want to write a for loop that does that. So these slides, these might be a little bit more complicated than they should be. But we're, what we're going to do here is we're going to show how to take this equation and turn it into something that looks more like this, or something that can use this. So the idea here is that you're looking, you, you start out with some in, initial intensity, so that's the accumulated color and accumulated alpha that are zero each. And you are looking at both the emission Emission, you can really think of as the color coming from each voxel, or each, really each sample that you take. And the absorption, the absorption is what you're storing. It's sort of like the accumulated alpha. Um, and that's what's, what you're going to compute along the way as you go. Um, now, 
if you had a completely homogeneous media, um, so if your values didn't change, you're looking at fog, for instance, uh, the way you would actually model this optically would be using this simple exponential function. So it's exp to the negative tau s0, s1, where s0 is this, and s1 is the end of your segment. Uh, so it's a nice, clean way of doing it. Unfortunately, looking at fog all the time is really boring. So, um, oh yes, and the, the, essentially the, when we're talking about, about the extinction coefficient, that's the tau here. And the, absorb, the absorption coefficient, so kind of equivalent to the alpha that we're trying to compute, is um, that's kappa. And this again shows up in the Sabella volume rendering equation. But the way they're, they're trying to model this, and this is really not along the samples along the array. This is really, in a sense, in transfer function space that you're going to have to figure this out. Um, they're going to integrate um, from S1 to S2. I'm sorry, this is along the array. Um, this is going to be along the array modeling, um, modeling of, um, essentially absorption. So uh, what happens to the alpha as you go along? And th uh, this active emission point, this uh, S squiggle, uh, is a sample in between S0 and S uh, that you're actually evaluating at. So the idea here is you take a discrete sample um, at this point, and you want to figure out how to modify your equation accordingly. Um, the, uh, another way of thinking about this is all of a sudden, if you take a sample at this S squiggle, you'll have to take another exponential term. So you can see if you do this over and over again, there's going to be some, some uh, well, summation involved. And ideally, when you integrate numerically, you want something that's going to be nice and smooth like this, where you're going to integrate over the absorption, over the kappa, with respect to t. So t is just the ray parameter. And you're going to try to integrate this as close to analytically as possible. Um, when I say as close, I mean we're actually using a Riemann sum to do it, and um, actually for uh, reasons, uh, it's actually not the plus operator here, it's the, um, it actually, uh, no, that, I'm sorry, that's, we're still a summation, yeah, this is uh, still a, a sum operator, um, where we're taking a fixed up size t, um, we have t along the ray, so we just divide that by the delta t, which is the fixed up size, and we, um, we use this to essentially um, do a sum of all these separate, these separate piece, these, these piecewise um, terms along the ray. So this is all along the ray in world space, not in transfer function space yet. This is just integrating in world space um, along the ray in one dimension. And this is really just a sum. I think that's showing more or less the same thing. Um, now, so well, remember that exponent, that e to the negative tau term that we had before? Uh, you can actually play a handy little trick with that. Ideally, you don't want to have to compute an exponential at every step when you integrate. Um, nowadays, it's not so bad on the GPU, but in the old days, this was colossally expensive, and there are good reasons to not do it. Um, so what they found is that you can actually turn this e to the negative sum term um, into one big product term. And um, they're going to show you how to do this. And uh, this is coming from uh, the uh, uh, from the first uh, slide tutorial from uh, Klaus Eng uh, from Klaus Engel's talk. Actually, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is Klaus Engel's talk, actually. Um, and the idea here is that using that over operator that we discussed before, so the alpha blending term, we're going to introduce opacity. So we're going to turn this exponential here into a fixed opacity term uh, that we're going to integrate repeatedly. And this is, this is a neat little trick. Instead of having, um, it, what we note is that if, you, uh, opacity, if opacity from the alpha blending uh, uh, equation that we had before can be modeled as one minus this exponential term. But if we move um, the one to the other side of the equation, then we can actually just match these literally verbatim, and then you can plug it into the equation, and then you just end up having a product of one minus opacity. And this should already start to look very familiar. This should start to look a lot like 
the um, alpha blending compositing equation that we had just a few slides ago. Uh, now there's just one problem with this. Right now, we've done everything in ray space, and we need to figure out how to integrate uh, nicely and analytically um, in the transfer function space. Well, really, to integrate the, uh, the color that we're getting out of, this, out of the transfer function classification. Um, and to do this, what we notice is we can actually simplify this e to the negative tau over here and find a way to replace this with the one minus, one minus alpha term. And in fact, what you're doing with that is you are using the one minus alpha term, the alpha blending step, to um, want to modulate the, the opacity, the, the color, so the, the, the emissive term. So anytime you see the CI, that's the emissive term. And the e to the negative tau would be, that would be the, uh, the absorption term or the opacity term. So this is what you end up with, is the sum of color times the product of absorption terms, or really the opacity terms. And this, this equation right here, this is, really, this is really the key to what we're doing. Uh, this is the discrete version of the Sabella equation that we had a few slides ago. And it's a little counterintuitive, but really, and there are other ways of doing it. So for example, if you have, this is assuming equidistant spacing along the ray. If you had non-equidistant spacing along the ray, you would have to go back and you'd have to keep this exponential term in there. And in fact, that's one thing that I've ended up having, having to do in one paper. And there are actually a lot of good reasons to do, to, to do that. It's very expensive to take samples, but if you know where you want to take them in space, then plopping an exponential term on there is not actually that costly. Um, so there are all sorts of optimizations you can do this way, but if you're taking uniform equidistant samples, which is what I would strongly recommend everyone does in homework six, uh, unless they want serious extra credit, then, uh, then this is really all you need to know. And again, to spell out what these terms are, anytime you see the C, this is uh, the emissive term. Anytime you see the, the one minus AI, although that's sometimes interchangeably used with, um, uh, the, with a, a uh, uh, um, apostrophe, um, that's the absorption coefficient. And the C's tend to be, uh, well, the C is going to be the, uh, the emitted, uh, the, the emitted um, so that's the color sample. And the C apostrophe is going to be the accumulated, um, uh, the accumulated uh, yeah, color sample, the accumulated intensity. Um, and again, we can do this front to back or back to front. So front to back is starting from the eye going towards the towards the back, to, towards the far plane, um, or the, the back of the volume. That's what we tend to do in, in ray casting. And back to front is the opposite. Back to front is what you more conventionally do in rasterization, where you start at the back and you, uh, you go towards the front of the scene. Um, but it, either way is fine. They, they end up being the same integral. For, um, you end up having two separate steps in front to back because you have to store the, uh, you have to store the accumulated alpha separately. But um, computationally, uh, they, they end up being about the same in practice. Um, that this, the cost of doing this compared to the other stuff we're doing with sampling and shading ends up being pretty low. Ah, and last thing. So when you're going through the, uh, through the volume, what's going to happen is you're, as you're going through the data set, your alpha, so your accumulated opacity, is going to increase all the time, because we're just adding to it as we go through the volume. And at some point, you're going to be able to say, okay, I'm opaque enough, I don't need to do any more work. And depending on what you've hit in the volume, that might happen here, or it might happen here. But you want to check for it anyway, because it can save you a lot of work, and uh, it can make your volume rendering much faster. And we call this early ray termination. So right here where it says stop the calculation when, um, when the uh, accumulated opacity is around 1, I tend to use 0.97 in, in practice. And this is just a big summary of everything that we've covered in these slides. And th this 
This is basically the solution to homework six right here. <laughs> there are a few things left out. Um, so for example, how to compute the, um, the, uh, the step size along the array and how to do alpha correction based on that. I will leave that up to your imagination. But um, with just a few minor tweaks, this should be all you really need to get a working volume ray casting implementation in homework six. Uh, I, this might make it less fun, but um, <laughs> I, I, I really want to hammer home. I, I mean, I, I actually remember the first volume recaster I did, and it was 60 lines of code and really disgusting. And um, this is before um, the, the Angle uh, real-time volume graphics book was out. And if I actually had a lot of these slides and had simple, even pseudocode like this, it would have made my life a lot easier. So that is my gift to you, is simple pseudocode. Use this over and over again. Do lots of volume rendering. That's, that's the whole point of this. Um, and again, this, there's this blend function right here. Um, you'll have to refer back to the blending implementation that we have right here. But this code will all basically drop in. And let me know if you have problems. I'll uh, have office hours by appointment, but um, I'll have office hours this Friday. Next week, I'll be going out to IEEE Biz. But, uh, if you have questions, feel free to use Piazza. I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. Let's see. And these slides are available on the class schedule? No, you can't see them now that I put them up. And of course they are. Okay. Yeah, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, transfer functions. OK, so uh, actually, this won't be too much help in implementing uh, the, the D3 transfer function part of the assignment, but it should at least give you a decent idea of what to expect from a 1D transfer function. So why do we need a transfer function? It sounds like an, off, like an awfully technical term for a really simple thing. Um, um, Alex likes covered color maps in class, right? Um, yeah. no, okay, good, good. Um, so a transfer function is really just a color map for volume rendering and for anything where you have um, semi-transparent primitives that you have to deal with and classify somehow. And in some ways, you can have multi-field data, you can have multi-attribute data, you can have tensor vector field data, and these are things that you'd like to ide ideally be able to turn into a color and classify directly also. Um, we won't talk about too much of that. I have maybe one or two slides on those crazier topics, but mostly for now we'll be talking about how to classify scalar field data. So one um, one field per voxel. Um, and the idea here is you, um, intuitively it's voxel value or interpolated voxel value maps to some color and some alpha. And specifically it maps to the emission term, the CIs that we had in uh, those previous slides from class angle, and the absorption term, the AI that we had in those slides. And uh, if you uh, classify opacity, just opacity, so this is ignoring color, you're able to take this big opa opaque, very uninteresting um, black uh, surrounding area, uh, surrounding the brain, and remove it. And all of a sudden, you start to see a guy's nose. And if you keep on doing that and, you're, uh, and you remove more of the inside of the volume, which I'm surprised that Josh didn't have the transfer function for this right next to it. It can make things a lot easier. But oh well. Uh, if, you, if you remove the interior, you can start to remove bits of his brain. And if you keep on going, you can start to remove even more of his brain. You can see um, individual, well, probably, uh, and probably not individual neurons, but definitely uh, a large, large portions of, um, I'm not even sure what those are. Are those? Those are those are blood vessels. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I was going to say dendrites would be a lot smaller still. Uh, <laughs> yeah. th those would be sub sub voxel uh, for a data set like this. Yeah, they're probably blood vessels. Um, and the again, the basic idea is you have values in space, and you're going to be using them to uh, map to color and opacity. And at the end of the day, you're, um, in 3D, you'll end up with nicely classified solid objects, potentially, like this. Um, so this transfer function editor, this is what, so Alex um, said sketch three designs. And this is, I would say, for 1D transfer functions, this is the design that I and 
probably most in the volume biz community like best, um, just because we're used to it. Uh, and the idea here is that you have the range of the, uh, of the scalar field on the x-axis, and then you have the opacity on the y-axis, and then you can create features along the range that um, essentially map to color. So you can have these triangular widget-like features that are red, blue, or yellow, whatever you want. And these are, in a sense, a little bit like ISO values, but with some control over their fall off, over their gradient. Um, so before you apply a transfer function like this to the human tooth, and again, this is no lighting and shading, nothing fancy. Uh, we're just going to do straight color mapping of this 2D data set. Um, th this is basically going to specify contours of this 2D data set. So you can see the yellow contour is very thick, the blue contour is fairly thin, and then you have a red contour over here. And this is what comes out of the color map, and this is uh, on the opacity channel, so the, the height of this plot over here, that's uh, what would come out of uh, applying the opacity uh, portion of the transfer function. Um, and then, so that's just applying the color and opacity map. If you want to light and shade it, oh, that's actually not very accurate because this is actually a 2D transfer function that they're showing the image from. Uh, so you're, you won't actually get anything quite this nice. Uh, but you'll get something. You'll get something fairly nice. Um, I'll, we'll go through this in just a few slides. So yeah, the basic idea is you start with uh, volume uh, with volume data in the domain, and you have a, um, a transfer function that is going to map from um, map features from range into the domain. Then you end up with um, uh, you end up with this colored opacity that's specified in the range that completely classifies your volume data set. Um, so what else can you control with a transfer function? So we mentioned the opacity and the color, um, but you can also use a transfer function to control lighting parameters. So for example, the ambient diffusive specular, you could create a, a transfer function like this. Uh, you could control um, other properties. For example, you could change cur based on curvature, based on um, based on gradient, we're going to see some transfer function editors that do that. Um, if you were want to get very fancy, uh, you could shade based on index of refraction. Uh, there's even a very nice paper um, and a very nice open source project called the Exposure Renderer that does a full classification into bi-directional reflection, uh, reflection distri uh, di uh, distribution functions, so BRDFs. And that's going back to the rendering equation that we saw a few slides ago. Um, and there you can basically use a transfer function to specify any material property and how rays are propagated from sample to sample in the scene. Uh, so in a sense, you can actually specify not just what happens with, as a ray goes through a volume in a straight line, but how a ray would bounce at each sample. And that gets very expensive, but you can make some very pretty things with that. Um, if I have time after, uh, we're, we're done at uh, 10.30, right? Okay, if there's time, I'll, I'll show you some, some pictures of that. Um, so the problem with transfer function editing is that it's very hard, and it only gets harder as you start to add dimensions. So in 1D, it's sort of intuitive, especially if you're used to ISO surfacing, but unfortunately I'm doing the volume rendering lecture before the ISO surfacing lecture, so this might be even less intuitive. Uh, but basically, the ISO, the ISO surface, the ISO value is just a contour, and the, the 1D transfer function is really just an extension of that that lets you classify all the range space. So I tend to think of that, tend to think that by playing around with an editor like the one in homework six um, that you're going to create, you'll have a pretty good sense of how volume rendering of, with 1D classification how that behaves. Um, and I, I tend to think that's fairly intuitive. It's not necessarily as flexible as you would like, but it is, uh, and sometimes it, it can get expensive to reconstruct the, reconstruct the features you want, but um, it, it generally is pretty easy. Uh, now that said, um, as you start to add dimensionality, if you're doing high order transfer functions, if you have multi-field data, vector or tensor field data, want to do anything um, with the, uh, the crazy classification of the RDFs that I was just talking about, it gets much, much more difficult to design a transfer function to 
handle those material properties. And, um, but that's kind of the problem in a nutshell, is that many of these volume data, that, uh, especially in the medical world, um, if they're coming from non-destructive testing, where you're blowing up suitcases and seeing what's inside you know, based on that or simulations of that, um, or if you're doing medical imaging where you have a CT or MRI data set, you really don't want to see volume data as just a bunch of red, green, and blue pixels that are all overlapping and all blended together and blurry. You want to see firm interfaces. You want to have materials that contrast so that you can immediately pick out what's different from everything else. Um, so uh, in a 1D, um, in a 1D case, you'd want to be able to say, material property for bone is, is this, material property for gray matter in the brain is something completely different. Um, and you'd want to have some transfer function editor, editor that conveys that. Um, I'm not quite sure what the num voxels is on this slide. Alex, do you remember? Well, but, it's, a, it's a histogram. Oh, oh, so we're talking about the histogram. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so when you classify volume data, and you're just playing around with the 1D transfer function editor, a lot of the time you're going to this blind. And you really trial and error is the only, the only tool you have available. In many cases, this isn't what you want. You want some intuition for where to start looking. And the histogram is a very powerful, well, sometimes very powerful <laughs> way of doing this. Um, if anything, um, so the histogram is basically, who's implemented a histogram before? Have we done this part? Oh, oh, oh yeah, Alex has done the history. Time for you guys. So um, the histogram is, it's basically just a count of currents for each range value that you have. And if you have very noisy data, you end up having a lot of occurrences that you really don't care about. On the other hand, you might see gradients in the histogram that indicate features of interest. So it's a little bit tricky, but it's certainly better than nothing. Um, and I'd say the standard in 1D transfer function design is to plot a histogram in the background and sort of use the histogram to guide where you put your transfer function. And again, a, a fairly non-intuitive way. A higher histogram value does not mean you should plot your, um, you know, the highest opacity over this value. It, that uh, very often if you do that, you'll end up with a lot of noise and not very good classification. Uh, but if, and if anything, you want to look for little perturbations like this sort of value over here, or this would be a lot of interest to me, um, for example, in a, in a medical data set. Whereas this enormous hump over here, close to, uh, close to the lowest value, that's usually a sign of something that I should avoid in where I place my transfer function. And this doesn't, maybe make, doesn't make sense when I'm saying it now, but it will make intuitive sense if you um, implement uh, homework six and start playing around with some of those medical data sets. You'll immediately see what I'm talking about. Um, so here's some some quick and dirty examples using a synthetic sphere uh, that's monotonically increasing. So if we uh, uh, if we have a uh, a little ramp and uh, and uh, a box, you can see this little box widget looks more or less like an isosurface, like a solid surface, and the ramp is um, sort of like a smoother a more, more transparent feature. And if you combine them, you can have a ice surface in the center and a smooth, smooth feature in the outside. And if you color them, you can actually apply the blue channel to just this, um, just the ice surface uh, box function over here. And then you end up with something like this. So this is sort of a way of assigning different material properties, uh, the simplest way of assigning different material properties to different features using 1D transfer function editor like the ones you're going to implement for homework six. Um, you can also have different colors uh, um, uh, that have the same opacity. Um, and this, this starts to get a little bit tricky because um, if you have a white feature here, uh, and this is sort of a quirk of alpha blending and a problem that People have spent a lot of time in you know, research trying to address and sort of get over. Uh, one of the problems is that if, uh, if, because of alpha blending, if you want to make the, uh, the feature in the center blue, 
Um, it really depends on the features that enclose it. Uh, so if you have a red feature that encloses a blue feature, you end up with a, pur a purple feature instead of a blue feature. And there's really no way around this unless you, um, unless you interpolate in a different color space than RGB, or if you have a completely different hacky non it's non-emission, non-standard emission absorption model that you're using for integration. So again, with uh, classification, finding the edges um, uh, using a technique like looking at the histogram uh, is, uh, and using and specifying one transfer functions, that's relatively easy. Um, and it's really just the transfer function equivalent of what you do with an isosurface. So you're able to find contours just by specifying single points in the transfer function like this, or, or single sharp features in the transfer function. Um, now, uh, how, however, this starts to be a little bit less intuitive where when you're looking at, um, well, yeah, actually, what am I looking at, Alex? <laughs> you're still looking at, so we're talking about the edge, this is leading into the transfer function. Oh, okay. All right, I can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. So, uh, all right. So material boundaries. Really, the transfer function is just classifying the range of one one variable, and boundaries can appear in all different places in the domain depending on what you've specified in the range. It's very very tough to control that unless you have additional parameters that, in a sense, tell you how quickly your transfer function falls off. So one thing you can do with a 1D transfer function is you can make this tent wide or narrow, but all that will do is make this feature wide or narrow. And the gradient may, in fact, it, it should change depending on what type, what type of volume data set you have. So the gradient um, will make this domain space feature be wide and narrow in certain places, um, but in range space, it, you'd end up having one single feature that controls something that is wide or narrow, depending on what the gradient is doing in domain space. Uh, so ideally, you'd like to have some way of controlling this, and in doing so, um, sort of having a filter for high gradient or low gradient features. And you'll pretty there, there's the example of the tooth really shows this off. Um, yeah, so these are actually really, really bad slides. <laughs> uh, I, I, I should have gone through these a, a little bit more thoroughly. I, I apologize for that. Uh, but the basic idea is that you want some control over gradient um, for especially a lot of medical data sets. A lot of data sets where you might have a lot of noise, you might have um, an interface, um, for example, a, a bone or a soft tissue interface that vanishes in unexpected places. Um, or you might have sampling artifacts that you just want to get rid of and you don't have a way of getting rid of them without having some control over gradient. Um, so that's really why you would want to start to go beyond one-dimensional transfer functions. Um, and beyond that, there, um, these are a laundry list of reasons why 1D transfer functions are actually fairly hard to create. Uh, they're non-spatial. You have uh, uh, many degrees of freedom. Um, this is you know, probably more for once you get to multi-dimensional data or higher dimensional transfer functions. Uh, you have no constraints or guidance on how to do that. And you're really assuming that you have a more or less uniform material um, uh, density. Uh, and if you don't have a uniform material density and you want to classify something you do, then you really need to start having multi-dimensional transfer functions. Um, and uh, so to design a good transfer function, well, I guess for your assignment, you only really have 1D to work with. But um, in a sense, for your purposes, less is more. Um, I would say in 1D, good 1D transfer functions look like features that you couldn't quite get out of just isosurfacing, but really show off the gradient properties of the data set and what gradient does to different portions of the data set. And I think this is especially true for medical data sets, like the foot, like the CT head. Um, so really, play around with different size tent features um, in your 1D transfer functions and see what that does for, for homework six. And these next slides are going to talk about what happens when you, uh, when, and how you would create these in practice. Um, 
So there are all sorts of, every year at IEEE Biz, you'll probably see a, probably four papers or so on improvements to transfer function design, automated transfer function design, or a better way of, um, of uh, generating them based on, um, based on the data that you have. Uh, sometimes they're domain specific, sometimes not. Um, the trial and error approach, this is really just the take a standard 1D transfer function and do the best you can. Spend hours to exhaustively uh, uh, edit your transfer function and see what looks best. And you know, back in, uh, and not just back in 2000 when uh, Lisa Avila and uh, Walt Schroeder were doing this in, um, in VTK, but even as recently as 2014, if I talk to someone like Joe Inslee, who does production biz for large-scale data, they'll very often just wing it and do it with 1D transfer functions. And having unlimited new, um, precision, at least floating point precision, as opposed to 8-bit uh, precision, very often will give them a lot of flexibility to essentially make lots and lots of little isosurfaces. One challenge of this is that you don't really appreciate it seeing this, still, this static image. But you can get very nice looking images with this technique without 2D transfer functions, but very often it costs a lot to render them. You have to take a lot of samples to get this to integrate into something nice with a 1D transfer function as opposed to a 2D transfer function. Um, and it takes a long, long time with a trial and error approach. So it's possible, but you're not always going to get what you want. Um, I'm going to gloss over these slides because I think we're running out of time. But um, there are all sorts of approaches based on Analyzing the the image, um, looking at the uh, at the image itself, um, very often picking a voxel that you're interested in, picking a feature that you're interested in, and trying to reverse engineer a good transfer function based off of that. And Joe Nissa's 2003 paper, no, I'm sorry, 2004 paper on multi-dimensional transfer functions, I, I I would actually count that as an image-centric approach. There's the data-centric approach, which is um, actually Valerio Viscucci, Hamish Carr, uh, people more on the isosurface and computation, computational geometry side and topology side, they've spent a lot of time in this area trying to figure out how to take the histogram and use it to uh, determine which iso values are more interesting than, other, than others and then use that to guide what a good transfer function would be. Um, so here's some examples of this work from Chandra Bajaj and Valeria Piscucci going back to this 97, where they're essentially computing a, a contour spectrum, a little bit like a contour tree, but without the tree, and they're using that to guide where the best isosurfaces would be, and therefore uh, create a transfer function. And they're able to identify skin, muscle tissue, and bone using this technique. Um, and lastly, this is probably the most, we're running out of time, so I'll probably have to cover, the, cover this next lecture, but uh, 2D transfer functions, um, especially like this, that are based not just on value, but on gradient, gradient magnitude, or really inverse gradient magnitude. Um, and this, this gradient code is the same as the code that I gave you a few slides ago for the shading. Um, you can also use, use this for better classification. And the idea here, um, I'll just, I think I'll cover this in the next lecture, because you really don't need this for homework six at all. But suffice to say that there are better ways of doing classification than 1D transfer functions. And um, th this, uh, yes, I will definitely cover this in the next lecture. Uh, this will give me more time to cover multi-field classification too. Um, yes, so this is a quick preview of what you're going to see in the next lecture, is uh, being able to more flexibly classify features in uh, in the tooth, but also other medical data sets using 2D transfer functions. Send me questions on Piazza um, if you have any problems with homework six. Hopefully that code will help. Thanks. How are you?